Welcome to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast, where we share all things people stuff in leadership. Learn from leaders who have done the hard yards and learn from experience. Hear from expert authors about the latest insights from culture to strategy and messy people dynamics. Get tips and insights from multiple award-winning author and leadership expert herself, Zoe Routh. Now, on with the show. Hi, this is Zoe, and I want to talk about phones, technology, and how it can sometimes get in the way of us being great leaders and great teams. It's something that I've been noticing a lot in the meetings that I've been facilitating with teams and leaders. And this is the thing. What do we do about phones? And my blanket rule has always been put your phones aside, no phone use while we are in session. Sounds reasonable, right? And yet there has been a lot of pushback lately, meaning that people need their phones. They need to be on call because they've got young kids in daycare and their kid's not quite well and they're worried that they're going to have an emergency call. Or they've got elderly parents who call them all the time for reassurance. Or they are waiting for a call from the media about particular something. There's always something that we need to be able to react to. And what does this do to us? This actually puts us in reactive mode all the time. And I have a fabulous conversation today with today's guest, Daniel C. He's a productivity expert and the co-founder of Space Makers. He's gone from being a physiotherapist to a productivity expert. And he specializes in basically down-regulating our technology use from time to time. So we have an extraordinary conversation about how we do that. How do we make space in our life for no technology so that we can make use of the technology when we do come back to it? So if you found yourself getting overwhelmed and sucked into your phone and other devices and you realize that you're exhausted at the end of the day, then today's interview is for you. Let's do it. Woohoo, all the way from, I don't know where, because I didn't even ask you before we started the introduction. Welcome to the show, Daniel C. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs> where are you actually in the world? I'm in Hobart, Tasmania. So I'm a fellow Aussie. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Very good. Ah, oh, lovely, lovely, lovely part of the world. So uh, no doubt it's, is it raining and horrible today? No, it's pretty beautiful, actually. You know, when I was boiling, it's like 16 degrees. It's amazing. <laughs> okay, good. Well, fantastic. Well, for everybody listening, this is Friday afternoon when we're recording this, and we're both a bit, <laughs> a bit silly. So we're not exactly sure how this is going to go today. It might be a little bit goofy, but I think it's going to be fantastic because we're talking about a topic that is prevalent and challenging for everybody, and that's digital overload. And before we get into that, though, Daniel, I'd love to know, how did you end up writing a book about this and getting into this field? Like, what's your professional trajectory to date? Yeah, so I've had a pretty unusual trajectory. I started off as a physiotherapist and worked in in a clinical field for 10 years, ended up in a deputy manager role and then moved into health management, and then I went to project management. And what I found is I just I just fell in love with managing and leading and and realized just how important productivity was in the mix of actually leading people well and leading yourself well. And so, look, I ended up training a number of people around me in the allied health field just uh, off the side of my desk to teach them how to you know, get their inbox to zero and how to use an online to-do list and some of the, the core skills that I have found so useful over my life. And that just it slowly grew and eventually I became a productivity consultant with my own business to help people make space in the whirlwind of life. Was that really weird to leave, you know, physiotherapy and go into training? Like, Yes. Did you miss the physio stuff? I didn't miss the physio stuff because I, I found that I loved managing in health more than I loved doing the health stuff. I think in terms of my strengths, I'm also a Clifton Strengths coach. So I think my strengths fit better with strategy and leadership rather than working with individual clients. But I did find the transition really unusual. I mean, I remember thinking at one stage, wow, I've, um, I did four years of undergraduate study. I've got a registration you know, nationally through APRA as a physiotherapist. And everyone knows what a physiotherapist is, right? And this is about nine years ago. And I, I literally took the plunge, you know, resigned from my permanent, well-paid senior job in health. And I was setting up a LinkedIn account with my business partner who started the business with me. And we literally said to each other over the phone, so what is our job now? And we thought, I don't know, 
how about we put productivity consultant? And we're like, that sounds good, and just typed it in. <laughs> and from that day on, I was a productivity consultant. And I just, I remember thinking, how strange that you can just create a new identity and and just run with it. But you know, once you are something, then you start to learn more and more about that field, and eventually you do become an expert. And that's the way in which the trajectory happened for me. Yeah, that's really cool. I love that sort of like, what should we call ourselves? I don't know, declare something and just put a line in the sand. Just make it up. Make it up and move (laughs) into it, right? So I like that. I like that as a leadership principle in general, actually. Decide who you're going to be and then be it. That's awesome. So let's um, let's dig into that expertise that you've been developing for, for so long. And this digital overload, I think we're people can resonate with that. It's like, how do we get away from screens and all the digitalness that we're experiencing. So t- what is your view on what is digital overload and what's the problem with it? Yeah. So look, I'd, I'd probably rather start with what's wonderful about it because I'm not an anti-tech no. type person. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> I know. want to throw rocks. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Just I know. kidding. Well, I mean, someone said to me the other day, so it's a bit like you're teaching people to diet by unplugging from tech regularly, you know. And I'm like, well, it's, it's not exactly that because like with a diet, you say, you know, you shouldn't eat chocolate too much. But, but with technology, my message is really you're eating chocolate like you know, three meals a day. Maybe you should just not have chocolate every meal. So there's a sense where we are online constantly, and I love it. I mean, you and I are talking through, well, it's not Zoom, it's through Riverside, and I'm in a different place. You know, my clients are all around the world. I couldn't do what I do without the wonders of technology and, you know, COVID. Can you imagine going through this pandemic without being able to communicate and use digital mediums to connect? So... Technology is fantastic, but for me, what I've realized is there's this point where too much technology starts to dehumanize us and where we start to experience, you know, like a physio, you know, diagnosing a problem where we're experiencing symptoms, where we are running to stand still, where we're constantly busy, uh, where we feel wired and tired and distracted and you know, where we're reaching for our phone first thing in the morning and putting it down last thing at night. And there's this, just, there's this sense where our life is being totally invaded or overwhelmed by our screen-based life. And it's starting to impact our health and our relationships and our focus, our spirituality. So they're the kind of things I'm seeing across society. And I call that digital overload. And at the beginning of my book, I, I map out what's the relationship between productivity and technology? Because that's really the question I started to ask when I coached leaders around different places. And and clearly, you need to use tech to be productive. So imagine a linear graph where you more technology equals more productivity. That's certainly true. But then eventually you plateau where more tech doesn't make you more productive. It makes you, I don't know, I suppose at least more tech just makes you busy, but but you don't get the right things done. And then if you imagine an upside down U, digital overload is when we've gone to the right hand side and the more tech we use, the less productive we are, the less happy and healthy we become. And the only way to become healthier and happier and more productive is by learning to unplug as a pattern to get back to that productive middle. And that's really the space I'm speaking into around this post-COVID world. Mm. Sometimes I think it's about the more technology that you use, the more it can go wrong and cause you more headaches. (laughs) Like I've had email issues this week, right? And I'm like, I I have no idea how to fix this. All my emails were going into everybody's spam filters. I'm like, why? Why? I'm doing it, not doing anything different. And I had to call in the experts who said, oh, you need this SBF record thing. I'm like, what the hell is that? And so like, all this technology is fantastic. And it's terrible if you don't have the know-how to fix it, not even knowing who to call to fix it can be the challenge. So I think there's there's an aspect of it all, the complexity piece, let alone just putting, I mean, putting it down and not touching it is one thing and trying to navigate the complexity of it is another. I want to ask you about this overload piece and because there's two questions I'm getting and my clients are wrestling with, with around the phones and so, and technology and its interruption of group flow and working relationships, as you alluded to, that's one of the complex problems. In team meetings, and this, I've been working a lot with teams lately, and the discussion comes up, what do we do about phones during a meeting? And my personal preference is no phones during the meeting. You put them way face down so everybody is in the discussion and is fully present. And there has been some pushback around that from people, which I was really surprised at. And their rationale is, well, I've got uh, an elderly mom in hospital who, if they need me, I need to respond, or I've got 
a toddler in preschool and I need to respond to that. And there was a range of reasons why people felt like they needed to have their phone for emergency calls. And the thought of not being able to respond immediately to these emergency calls was stressing them out. So this one group in particular said, well, we agree not to use it for intentional disengagement. So if you're bored or frustrated, not to just go, hmm, I'm going to scroll. And even though that's what they committed to, you can still tell that's what they were doing. <laughs> or the temptation is there to go to it. So I'm curious about what your stand is around use of tech in that kind of forum when you were meeting in person in particular, phone use. What's your stance? So I think it depends on what type of meeting you're doing and what the purpose and benefit and outcome is. So there have been two research studies that I read, which I think are particularly relevant. And I, I can't remember the names uh, of who ran them. But uh, one of the studies was trying to look at the relational connectedness between people. So there are a set of questions. And the idea was to get two people in a room who knew each other a bit, but not particularly well. And they would ask questions and the assessors would look at their body language and try to rate the quality and depth of their conversations from an emotional and connectedness point of view. And the control was one group had a pad, a notepad on the desk, and the other had a, a mobile phone, someone's mobile phone, face down, not touched, silent. And they found that the quality of those engaging relationships was statistically worse when there was a phone, even if it wasn't touched, even if it, was, it didn't go off. So definitely having a phone between us in a relational, a relational conversation changes the EQ and the emotional connectedness because uh, the research has suggested it's a bit like having a toddler. You're always listening out with one ear to find out if it will kind of shout and yell or have a tantrum, and that just impacts your ability to deeply connect with the person in front of you. So for meetings where the aim is to build relationship and to really hear each other, then phones being away altogether is really important. The other one is cognitive control. So there was another one. This guy was Andrew uh, Prisbelitsky, and he did a study, the same type of thing, where they gave people a complex cognitive task to process, something that was just difficult to think through, and the control had no phone on the table. The other one had a phone turned off in front of them, and again, people who have a phone in front of them, even if they don't touch it, even if it doesn't ring, did statistically much worse off in a complex cognitive task, which again is really interesting for meetings. So basically, if you want people to be at their best and problem solve something or think deeply through something, no phones. Where phones and technology are useful is if you need the tech to present or potentially if you're needing the information on the phone to help interact with the brainstorming. So again, it has to be outcome specific and it needs to be well thought through. But yeah, no phones are better for most meetings. Mm. I intuitively know that even without the research uh, as a facilitator, I can tell like people's ability to process and engage is immediately diminished, even if though they say they're listening while they're scrolling or you can't, <laughs> your brain just can't process it. So uh, yeah, I think that the challenge is how do you respond then to the anxiety that people have not being able to check their phone because of the reasons that I mentioned. And so they are anxious because they've got this screaming digital toddler not being looked after, you like. Yeah, well, I don't, so I don't think we're anxious for the reasons we say we are. I think there's a story under the story that really uh, describes what's happening. And this is why I spend more than a third of my book talking about our relationship with the online world and the paradigm of technology. Because I, I originally wrote, I mean, I wrote this book, it took me seven years of reading, of researching, of rewriting. And it came out of me just writing a blog post that said, I turn off my phone a day a week for a digital Sabbath. And I found that a helpful tip. And that, that gained so much interest seven years ago when people weren't thinking about the idea of detoxing from tech. And I thought I'll just put in a quick, you know, write 20 pages. These are my habits. But in reality, as I coach people and as I listen to people's stories, read the research, what I discovered is that there is a deep narrative that goes on in our culture and in ourselves that calls us to almost be codependent with our phones and our technologies, where our loves and our longings are expressed through our phone, where our beliefs around freedom and choice impact it, uh, where the neuroplasticity of our brain has changed so that we are reliant on constant connection because of neuroplasticity based on the practice we give in the internet. And there's narratives around uh, the power that comes through technology and how it makes us feel. So unless we can actually understand the real relationship we have with technology, 
we'll never be able to do something as simple as not check our phone first thing in the morning or not not think about our phone and actually have a really focused meal with our family without technology. We need to change the heart in order to change the behaviours. And that is a story I think we need to really examine when it comes to digital overuse. Yeah, yeah. And in a different, like I'm just thinking about this group I just worked with where there's already tensions in the group. So they're not a high performing team yet. And the phone use is used as a deflection, as a way of escaping the tensions there. And so the rationale of I need my phone because I need to respond to X, Y, and Z is it's part of that crutch, I think. Crutch addiction, the dopamine stuff that's all addicted to all that Pavlovian response to the ding-dings that come in. The other part of this I want to explore too is because it's the question that's coming up for a lot of the leaders I work with who are parents is what about kids and phones? Like, what do we do about that? Because presumably they're even more susceptible to developing poor habits with this. I mean, if adults can't handle it, I'm sure kids got struggling too. So what are your thoughts around that? Yeah. So look, I actually run seminars for schools and uh, for parents. So I run a seminar f- called Digital uh, digital Parenting for Parents with Tweens. So that's the primary school and then a one for teens. And they're quite different issues depending on the age. So the, you know, the question that you asked, you know, I suppose, when should you give a child a phone? That's the question. I mean, that's the question I get asked all the time, which is why I started to look in the kids realm. And that's such an interesting question because again, it comes down to both the parents' practices and beliefs that shape what we actually do. So one of the huge reasons, you know, when I ask parents, why do you give your child a phone, let's say in year two or year three, like which is way too young from a developmental point of view, when the screens are not filtered and when there's uh, not contracts in place and a whole lot of other stuff uh, that you need to do to be healthy in giving your kids an adult device. And parents typically say two things. They say, one, I want my kid to be safe Okay, and secondly, so you know, so they can basically contact them twenty four hours a day. So safety is one. Uh, the other reason is just that they've been nagging, and everyone else is doing, it and it's just too hard not to. And I think both of them uh, are terrible reasons. When it comes to safety, when you look at safety stats for, let's say, violent crime in Australia or the US, the violent crime has gone down since the nineteen nineties and the nineteen seventies, eighties. Like crime has gone down, violence has gone down. We are far less likely to be abducted than we were in the 70s. And yet our vigilance for not letting our kids breathe or have any space disconnected from us has just disappeared. And interestingly, at the same time, cyberbullying, grooming, a lot of the stuff that is really dangerous and that is really prevalent, including asking for nude selfies and all this kind of stuff from strangers... That in is, kid, like what? In kids. Oh, yeah. primary school kids, absolutely. That has massively gone up. Yeah, now there's um, a fascinating movie called uh, Childhood 2.0. You can get it for free on the internet. And um, they got a young primary school age girl and they got her to sign up for Instagram before she's you know old enough, of course. And they just tracked how many strangers tried to groom her and it was in the hundreds. It was incredible. So the real danger happens when we give our kids phones so that the safety argument doesn't match up whatsoever from the research. And the second thing is, you know, <laughs> I want to make my life easier because I'm sick of saying no. And I totally get that as a parent. But the reality is as soon as you say yes and give your child their first smartphone in primary school, then it's, can I have Snapchat? Can I have Instagram? Then can I be on my phone here? Can I have this toy? Can I have this game? So you're, you're still going to have to be an adult and put healthy boundaries down. And it just actually gets harder, not easier. And the no's have to come more prevalently if you're going to raise your kids in a healthy way. So, so I don't think that matches up either. So I just, I think it comes down to what is a phone? How do we relate to it? And how do we let research shape our behaviors rather than culture and emotions and maybe the pressure that comes from the shareholders of Silicon Valley tech companies that want us to adopt really, really early at age inappropriate ways. I hope that doesn't freak parents out. But uh, I'm freaked out and I'm not a parent. <laughs> there's no judgment whatsoever. Uh, I'm certainly not saying you're a bad parent if you've given your child a phone really young like most parents are, but I am asking parents to really think about what's driving their decisions to look deeply at the impact of that, particularly as young people grow up and how it impacts their mental health and their happiness, and to be willing to actually take the brave step to slow down even when others are going fast. Okay. 
sage advice, and I'm trying not to think that, think about the terror that I'm experiencing, thinking about poor little kids getting groomed. So yeah, it's really hard. Uh, yeah. So moving on from that meh, is I'd want to ask you about the digital Sabbath that you mentioned because Sabbath just sounds delightful. Digital Sabbath sounds scary because. People like their devices. I like my device. I'm thinking, oh my God, does that mean I have to put my iPad down? I have all my books on an iPad. So tell me a little bit about why that's one of your core habits. Yeah, look, I love I love my digital Sabbath. And I, I remember originally, I mean, it took me a while to learn how to do it, but I remember one conversation with an executive I was coaching and I su- just suggested because they were so tired and they never rested and they were always online. They're checking their email right throughout the weekend like I used to do. And I just said, what about you also consider turning off your phone for a day a week? And it was like, <laughs> I don't know, you know, WTF, you know, what's that for? And uh, it was so confronting to this person and they could only see what they would miss out on. You know, oh, I'm going to miss out on, you know, the news, on relationships, on the weather, on what's happening around me. But I, I kind of tried to help them frame it another way. I said, how often are you on a screen? And like me, they are literally on a screen from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to sleep most of the time, and they do it seven days a week. I'm like, how beautiful is it to have one day a week where you get white space from digital noise, where you're unplugged, where you can rest, where you can play board games with your kids, uh, where you can go bike riding or go into the garden or read a book or just do nothing and know that no one is going to shout at you, no one is going to interrupt you, you don't have to check your email You don't have to fill your mind with stuff that looks and feels like work. And I I just think it's beautiful and it's a a life-giving practice. And the, the problem in our culture nowadays is we find it really hard to rest. And I don't think we've truly considered the impact of technology on our inability to rest because the ancient practice of Sabbath, which is actually a religious practice, is really about disconnecting from work one day a week and then focusing on worship and family and community. But in our culture, for me, work involves this. We're communicating online. Uh, I'm using the internet. I'm swiping screens. I'm flipping between internet pages. That's what I do for work. And then what I found is I would go home and that's exactly what I would do on my day off and my time off. I just use different apps and different screens, you know, but the brain can't tell the difference between Outlook and Instagram, can it? And so we never stop working from a neurological perspective. And so I realized if I was to truly rest, that had to involve my mind because I'm a knowledge worker, not just my body. And therefore, I had to rethink my relationship with the online digital world so that one day a week I could regain independence from this world I love so much and experience the types of activities that actually bring health and happiness beyond the digital world. So I love Sabbath. I can hear that you love Sabbath. I can hear that there's good benefits from it. How do you set it up? Yeah, so look, it's actually the hardest of all the habits that I have in my book, without a doubt. I believe, firstly, you you frame it around two principles. Um, And I've written for, I haven't written this in a religious way, so it's not really a Sabbath because Sabbath, I have to acknowledge, is a religious activity. But if I called it a digital day off in my book, and to do that, I still think there are two principles that are really helpful. Uh, One is rest. So you want to orientate the day around activities that are deeply and truly restful. Uh, And the other one is remembrance or reflection. You want to orient around reflection and spiritual thought-provoking activities. And so with that in mind, uh, there are five Ds. One is a day. You've got to pick a day. So you need to pick what 24-hour period will you rest. For me, it's Friday after from dinner to Saturday uh, when we have dinner again. You need a day. You need uh, to disconnect, so obviously turn off your devices. Uh, one, the, the third D is dinner, which is really about preparation and ritual. So what we've found, and this is what you see in the Sabbath practices, is it's very hard to switch off from work mode to rest mode. And so it's really helpful to both prepare for that and create a ritual to lean you into that. So what we do is we finish work a little earlier on a Friday, we'll clean the house, we'll do the dishes, we'll make sure that we can leave things in the state they're in so we don't have to work and feel like you know we're in this kind of mess for the next 24 hours because the dishes will pile up and uh, we're not going to vacuum and all that kind of stuff on our day off. And once we've prepared, 
then we have a ritual. So for us, we light two candles and we talk about rest and uh, reflection. Uh, we drink wine. My wife and I drink wine. The kids have a drink. We eat together. We do what is our high-low buffalo from the week. So what's our high from the week? What's our low point from the week? And what's something random or funny or interesting like a buffalo? Is that the buffalo? <laughs> yeah, that's the buffalo. Yeah, yeah it's a buffalo. It's an American term. Before. I love it. High-low buffalo. And our devices get put away and we are now having Sabbath. Does that make sense? And so it's beautiful. And then the last two Ds are you need to work out what is work for me and therefore what won't I do, which is are the don'ts. What are the don'ts? So for my wife, who's a nurse, she doesn't care for people <laughs> as much as she can on her Sabbath. Whereas No uh, caring on Saturday. No caring. Yeah, no caring. You know, I mean, obviously, if the kid falls over, she'll pick him up. But, but we're really careful not to kind of care. I don't look at the news or anything like world event wise because I just find it makes me sad or depressed. And we don't talk about politics on Sabbath. You know, so I was trying to work out what is work for me. And then they're the don'ts. And then the do's are, well, what is really restful? And it's really surprising what you come up with. I mean, because I sit at my desk and I'm a knowledge worker on tech all day long, rest for me is the opposite. So rest for me is getting out in the garden. I have land and I chainsaw a lot of the time on the Sabbath because it's physical. It's kind of doing stuff. Yeah, restful chainsawing. It's restful chainsawing. <laughs> I love it. I always feel really energized having chopped wood for an hour or reading a book is restful, playing board games with my kids, you know, going riding, going and eating ice cream together is restful. Uh, we eat lots of bad food on Sabbath. It's like Wednesday nights, which is uh, our dinner with friends, and Saturday uh, which is our Sabbath, we eat lots of crap. And um, so, so there's like, it's what it's are the things? It's fantastic. So what are the things that bring us joy and help us rest? And that's what we do. And in the book, as well as on my website, I've got a planning guides and videos to actually help you plan a day oriented around rest and reflection. I love it. So your chainsaw pig out day. My chainsaw, yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, eat ice cream as I'm chainsawing, but yeah, it's, you know, I do enjoy a beer after I've chainsawed at least. Oh, goodness. <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, so that's the hardest of the habits. What are a couple of more of your digital habits? Yeah. So like I have annual habits uh, weekly. So the weekly one is the digital Sabbath and then I have daily habits. So look, an annual one for those who are super busy is booking your holidays before you book your rest. Now, that might sound really simple, but it's the same principle as Sabbath. You know, Sabbath as a principle is you put in the best of your time first to rest and then you let your work happen around it. Uh, very similarly, I believe annually, it's really important to plan out your holidays and think about how they can be truly restful before you put any meeting or schedule or podcast or whatever it is into your calendar, realizing that I think it was something like 70% of the busiest people in Australia say that they don't have time to take their annual leave and that's because they're too busy. And so the busier you get, the more important it is to make space and prioritize holidays in advance and to think about what technology might look like in that space. So that's one of my very simple habits, but it can be very useful to people who find that they habitually leave their annual leave to just kind of happen when they're exhausted. And that's not a great pattern if you look at it annually. A daily practice, one of my favorites is actually a digital free meal. I love that. So there's tons of research around the benefits of eating at a table without technology, particularly if you have a family and you've got children. But, you know, with anyone, you know, like just the research is incredible. It increases numeracy and literary skills for for young children. If you have a 12-year-old girl, the research shows in one kind of longitudinal study and you ate with them as a family without technology every day or roughly, you know, regularly, well, then by the time they hit adulthood, they have higher college entrance scores. It was a US study. Uh, less debt. They're less likely to be pregnant. They're much less likely to be addicted to drugs. They end up with higher income levels, better mental health in adulthood. That study has been repeated in multiple ways. The research is really strong about eating. Uh, and it's got nothing to do with what you eat. You can eat like $2 frozen pizza from Woolies, or you can cook them organic broccolini, and it doesn't matter. It's about connecting as people face-to-face -face, without devices and talking regularly 
and that somehow transforms people's mental health and happiness and relationship. Uh, and the meal is really sacred for that space. So that's so simple. And you know, it's like our conversation about digital free meetings, but on steroids, because there's food involved and it's people you love. And so if you want to transform you know, the health and happiness of your children, I reckon start by just eating without your phone around a table. And that's a great start. That's one very simple day-to-day habit. I like that as a habit. I like also the potential of eating $2 pizza it means you could be successful at uni. <laughs> <laughs> How good is that? I love it. And we, we have favorite questions, you know. Our favorite questions are what's your high-low buffalo? I mean, sorry, when I, the reason I give people questions in the book, okay, is I always thought this isn't that complicated. But I remember training a group of global – they weren't executives, but they were senior workers in a global corporate – And they're in their 20s, all of them between probably 24 to maybe 32 years old. And I talked about the research. And then one of the girls said, oh, we've just started eating a meal around the table on Wednesday nights as flatmates. And it's amazing. And it's like we're back in the 1960s. And then everyone in that meeting, there are about 25 people, were like, wow, we should try that one day. And I'm like, wow, like none of you have ever experienced eating regularly with others. So as simple as that sounds, that habit, we're losing it. So I'm even helping people now work out how might you talk without a phone. And that's where the high low buffalo is great. Oh my God. Uh, You know, questions like, what are you thankful for? And then everyone just practices gratitude. Uh, Or questions like, you know, what has been a wonderful challenge for you this week? So there are research-based questions I put in the book if you actually don't know how to start this habit and talk to people without a phone. I hope that doesn't sound too simplistic, but the research is incredible. If we can learn to relate to each other again, we can actually really increase our productivity and our happiness. I love it. And since you are a productivity expert, this makes a lot of sense. Like sometimes it's productivity is about living well, not just about doing stuff. You've got these great lists of courses, which I love on your website. You're the list assassin looking at workloads. You're Priority Samurai and the Email Ninja. I'm like, oh, such good branding. I love it. <laughs> what tip have you got from from making lists or managing workloads? That's I was curious about that. Yeah. So look, I mean, I just trained a team today in how to become a list assassin. And it's interesting because, I mean, what we're doing is we're teaching people to have four habits, capture, organize, review, and do. But it's not about writing a list. It's actually about recognizing the complexity of our life and the complexity of our world right now. And that the brain was never, ever designed to remember the amount of stuff we try to remember. David Allen, I actually heard this on the podcast that you had a few weeks ago, which was, you know, said that our brain is designed to remember, to have ideas, but not remember ideas. And there's this sense where our brains just get overloaded and feel stressed without a personal system. So, yeah, I train people to capture every idea that they have and have it in a kind of a habitual pathway. It always goes to the same app on my phone or to a moleskin or to a notebook whenever I have an open loop, which is what David Allen says is a, an idea that comes to the front of your mind and then disappears. And, and if we can clear our mind of all the stuff that we need to remember and have that habit of capturing it in one place – Uh, then organizing it into a two-level list where we have projects and tasks, not just one list with big and small stuff all mixed up, which is a terrible idea. Then review it once a week, just for half an hour, you actually plan your week. And then every day you have a mental map of what the three most important things are out of that list to do. It can transform not only your productivity, but it can transform your mental health actually and your, your creativity because you actually have the capacity to have big dreams and big ideas, uh, which are just, you cognitively resist ideas when you don't have a system to capture them and ideate on them because your brain just thinks I'm too busy and I'm exhausted. I don't want an idea. And so there's a whole lot of benefits to learning how to, I suppose, become a list assassin. And in reality, you know, we just had too much whiskey one night. And so we came up with Ema Ninja, which was the name of our <laughs> first course. <laughs> and then we didn't know what to do after that. Well, we've got a course called Ema Ninja. If you wrote a course called How to Get Things Done with a List, it kind of doesn't really work next to Ema Ninja. So it kind of became <laughs> this ridiculous branding where we hand out ninjas and assassins to people at the end of a course. 
No, no. What I want to know is that you spent 30 grand consulting a marketing and branding <laughs> expert who said, this is fantastic. <laughs> you love martial arts and this has got a great tone to it. <laughs> In any case, the whiskey option is also good. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we didn't spend 30 grand on whiskey. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. By correlation or causation, it means whiskey is better than branding marketing. Yep. So let's move without a segue into... <laughs> Into the title of your book so people can come and find it. Space Maker, Unplug, Unwind, and Think Clearly. It has won the Personal Development Award at the Australian Business Book Awards of 2021. Congratulations, as well as finalist for book cover design and finalist for the technology category. Well done. I love Thank the, you. I don't you just love those little labels you get on the book? It's awesome. <laughs> so where can people find out more about the book and you and your work? Yeah, so look uh – at spacemakers.com.au, is, that's my website, and there's information about the book. You can also go and download the handouts on how to design a digital Sabbath and videos as well. And you can obviously buy it pretty much anywhere now in terms of online stores. It's an audio book. It's an e-book. But essentially, it's about my passion for helping busy people make space to think deeply and rest fully and uh, reconnect with loved ones away from a phone and it's packed with research and also stories from my coaching experience and just very practically helps us change our relationship and our paradigm of the online world, reorient our life around healthy principles, and then just there's a, a bunch of really practical stuff to help us unplug on a regular basis, not to reject technology, but to experience a bit of independence and life outside of the, the constant churn of being always on. Fantastic. Daniel, thank you so much. This was a pleasure. Great way to spend a Friday afternoon. And I hope you have an excellent Sabbath coming up. Thank you so much, Zoe. And now we can, you know, be silly by turning this off and and, uh, relax for the weekend. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. Well, that was a totally fun experience. I really enjoy talking about technology and having technology Sabbath in particular. I learned quite a lot from Daniel's insights on the research around phone use and and what it means and how addictive they are and its impact on us. I think he's right. Technology is such a gift to us, and yet we need to put boundaries around it. We need to get back to what really matters. And so if we can have the discipline to let down the phone, get away from the dopamine addiction, then we can discover other aspects of our world that we can be ignoring. So I really quite enjoyed that aspect of it. And I'm going to have a go at doing the digital Sabbath once again. (laughs) I've been successful in the past, and I think it's time to have a crack at it again to see, see what else I can gain and not lose by doing it. So that's my commitment. I'm going to experiment with that. If you've enjoyed the show, feel free to rate and review the show. It really does help. Or share this episode with somebody you think needs to hear it. That's also a good thing. This episode has been brought to you by Amplifiers, our advanced leadership training program for CEOs, managing directors, and senior executives. And if you're looking to expand your capability as a leader so that you can deliver bigger and better results for greater impact, then this is a community for you. We meet quarterly face-to-face in Canberra or online for our virtual groups gathering from outside of Canberra. And we have webcasts in between. We have a book once a quarter. And we have a whole online platform, which has some self-study paced programs on the core fundamentals, lead change, lead culture, lead strategy, lead performance. It's a whole system of elevating your leadership. And if you're up for it, we'd love to have you. Just check us out at zoerouth.com, click on programs, click on amplifiers, or email me, zoe at zoerouth.com. We'd love to see you accelerate and amplify the results of your own work and the work of the people around you. In the meantime, live well, lead well. You've been listening to the Zoe Routh Leadership Podcast with leadership expert Zoe Routh. For more about people stuff and to contact Zoe, go to zoerouth.com. (laughs) 